So Albert uh, Furihara, a Japanese American who was interned after the attack on Pearl Harbor, writes, I remember having to stay at the dirty horse stables at Santa Anita. I remember thinking, am I a human being? Why are we being treated like this? You see a dark-skinned woman seated on the ground, apparently cooking something on some logs, fabric-like tents in the background. Abel, a 20-year-old from Afghanistan living in the jungle of Calais, the makeshift camp in France, says to his interviewer, they treat us like animals, he continues. We are human. These people are someone's son. They are someone's brother. This is a nightscape, city nightscape. Several protesters are facing a row of riot police. A Fox News reporter tries to fathom why someone would be protesting the police shooting of Keith Lamont Scott in the streets of Charleston, South Carolina. Scott, who is black and had traumatic brain injury, was killed when he failed to obey police commands. The woman he addresses uh, the woman he addresses, the reporter addresses, shouts out in undisguised anger. If I crossed the street on which Scott was shot, I could still be shot there by the police. Then she asks the reporter, do you see me? We are not the same. We are human, but I am black and you are white. And in those statements, she effectively says that her blackness is treated as if somehow it occludes her humanity. While it is hard to imagine any philosopher questioning the moral import of invocating one's humanity in contexts like the ones above, a philosopher once asked me during a question and answer period why the humanity of my daughter gives her a moral claim to better treatment than that of an intelligent animal such as a pig. This is because my daughter, Sasha, uh, who is pictured here, is a beautiful woman of 48 with lively brown eyes and a winning smile. She has very significant cognitive disabilities. She has no measurable IQ and can do nothing for herself by herself. She defies the philosophical characterizations of what is human, namely the possession of certain essential attributes assumed to be definitive of the human. Yet human she is. You know her human humanity in every movement, every look, every response. You know it when you see her thrill to music, giggle at something she finds funny, or reach out her arms to embrace you. When she puts her head down shyly or beams when complimented, she has the feel and touch and smell of a human being. And above all, she's my daughter. Fortunately, we've abandoned the cruel myths of mothers who give birth to disabled children as having consorted with the devil. While my daughter may not be able to do much more than a very young child, her understanding outstrips her manifest physical abilities. As human beings, we also possess properties that we have only in virtue of relationships we are in with other human beings. These are relational properties. I propose that we turn to these relational properties to understand the moral significance of being human. That significance lies in being able to live our lives among other human beings as equals. Living life as a human being and in the recognition that one is a human being like all other human beings is what moral parity with our fellow humans demands. There is nothing marginally human about people such as my daughter. We know from our history that legitimizing such a category provides a slot, can be, a just, can be justification enough for those with the power to deprive, neglect, enslave, and even murder those who are only marginal. The Nazis' first victims were those with mental disabilities. The claim that humans are not equal threatens to plunge us backwards. 
The idea that all men were created equal was hard won, and it's taken centuries to make all men include women, racial, ethnic, and sexual minorities, and people with disabilities. We need to defend the equality of people with cognitive disabilities, however, not only because failing to do so can create dangers for the rest of us, but because the people with cognitive disabilities are the people we love, our neighbors, fellow citizens, and us in other circumstances. For all the reasons that we have a right to exist and flourish, so they have a right to be in the world in all the fullness of their being. We have moral obligations to other human beings for the simple reason that we find ourselves in relation to them. We cannot be the sorts of creatures we are except by being in relationship to other human beings. The fact that my daughter is my daughter creates a set of moral obligations to her that others do not have and that I can't forego without well-warranted reproach. These obligations are temporally and ontologically prior to my knowing anything about her other than that she is dependent on me. You might have a daughter or a child. You have some understanding of how vital it is for you that your child should be respected as a moral equal. I am inviting you to consider if your son or daughter were like my own, would you consider her as morally the equal of a pig, much as you might like and respect pigs? This is an exhortation to the reader or hearer to take the ramp of moral access, to look at another human being as a possible I, whom we take an interest in, express a concern for, knowing that by virtue of this relation, the other exerts a moral authority over us. With animals other than humans, I cannot project an I into another possible universe where I am that being. But I can see myself in the Japanese internment camp in the jungle of Calais as the mother of a young black son lost to police brutality or the child of a police officer killed while on patrol. And I can see myself in the disabled person who, like my daughter, needs someone to speak for her. Each is a facet of myself refracted in the prism of possibility. It is the real as well as the possible relations to other human beings, not any set of intrinsic properties belonging exclusively to humans that ensure that being human will always remain morally significant.